हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर राजेश चोखानिया जनरल पीडियाट्रिशियन फ्रॉम बैंड्रा मुंबई थैंक यू फॉर बीइंग विथ अस एंड वाचिंग आवर लास्ट 77 वीडियोस बिफोर वी मूव ऑन टू आवर नेक्स्ट मेजर सेक्शन ऑफ वीडियोस ऑन क्लिनिकल साइंस वी थॉट वी शुड समराइज द मैसेजेस फ्रॉम दीज अर्लियर वीडियोस एज यू नो दीज अर्लियर वीडियोस वर डिवाइडेड इनटू काइंड ऑफ कैप्सूल्स ऑफ अप्रोक्सीमेटली 8 वीडियोस ईच व्हिच वर ऑन अ रिलेटेड कांसेप्ट और टॉपिक सो each such capsule will be summarized in one video for the next 11 videos and we have titled this subsection lest we forget so let's begin with the first of this series of lest we forget and today's title is medicine think science and beyond we have coined the term steer which stands for sensitizing to think enabling excellence and rationality what is this steer concept Right from our school and college days, we've been memorizing a lot of information and then hoping to retain and retrieve it. If we start thinking about the various aspects of this information that we are exposed to, it helps us to convert it into knowledge, which is more likely to be retained and then retrieved. Thinking also helps us to use the same piece of knowledge differently under differing circumstances. In other words, we acquire the wisdom to apply this knowledge by thinking. All of us have the ability to think, but in most circumstances, most of us do things mechanically. So, we need to be stimulated or sensitized to think. Rationality, as you know, is trying to diagnose the patient's problems clinically as far as possible with the use of minimum investigations and then treating it with the most appropriate minimum medications. Once we are sensitized to think, we can achieve rationality more easily and more often. And finally, thinking also helps us to look beyond only the diseased organ to the patient as a whole. And this kind of a holistic approach is one step towards excellence. So. The steer concept is that by guiding and steering everyone towards the process of thinking, we can enable everyone to achieve rationality and excellence in their individual practices. You might feel a little unsure that with medicine being so uncertain, is it possible to practice rationality? At this point, we must remind ourselves that while medicine is a science, it is also an art. So medicine is a science of uncertainty, but the art of probability. What makes it uncertain is the numerous etiological possibilities in almost every case and the various agent host environment related variables that modify a response to treatment. But what bails us out is the fact that it is logical to expect what is most probable both in diagnosis and in treatment. If we were to prove every diagnosis in black and white and in effect rule out all others in black and white, this would be an Herculean task for both patient and doctor alike. But if we were to use the art of clinical medicine, which in effect means we are using the science of probability, then a well thought out provisional diagnosis is most likely to be correct. Further, if we were to use the art of coming across as a doctor who cares, we instill faith in the minds of the patients and it allays their anxieties about all these uncertainties, thereby increasing the chances of a good outcome. So, we must achieve a harmonious marriage between the science of medicine and the different ways of the art of practicing it. We try to treat diseases to the best of our ability, but should we be limiting ourselves to doing just that? In other words, we must try to change from becoming from being disease managers to becoming health promoters. We must take a leaf from our traditional systems of medicine which did emphasize promotion of health 
even while trying to treat diseases. We must take every opportunity that we get to educate patients on how to promote health and prevent disease. We must emphasize to them that they should not assume that good health will happen naturally or automatically. They need to take many appropriate steps actively to prep to maintain not only good physical health but also good mental health. In other words, we need to keep advising them on their diet, exercise, sleep, avoidance of unnecessary drugs and so on and even tell them on how to keep using their mental faculties to keep stimulating their brain and in this way try and maintain the functional integrity of all organs. There have been rapid advances in the fields of diagnosis and therapeutics. So there is no doubt that all of us need to remain updated especially if we have been trained a while earlier. But then there are challenges. There is so much to update and there is so little time. So a possible solution is to update selectively so that at least as a priority we remain updated in those areas which we regularly deal with. Nowadays there is also a trend of practicing evidence based medicine. The challenge is to try and find a balance between good old experience which has stood the test of time and which we want to continue using and to generate evidence wherever possible to eliminate subjective bias. Another trend is that of super specialization and again the challenge is to balance between escalating the cost of healthcare by using super specialists indiscriminately and compromising the quality of healthcare by not taking their help at all. But the most difficult challenge nowadays is to successfully meet the expectations of the new generation patients who are more informed and more demanding and all this in an era where the style of practicing medicine has changed it has become a fiercely competitive rat race. So in this era, it is all the more important that we must communicate and counsel patients. Communication is about telling them more information about the uh, disease and diagnosis so that it tries to answer many questions in their minds. Counseling is guiding them and helping them to take decisions and supporting them to overcome their problem. And all this has to be done skillfully. We need to be accurate, brief and clear. We need to use a very simple non-medical language and we need to give real life similes so that they understand. But the most important is we need to find time to do all this because it is only communication and counselling that can bridge the holes or fill the lacunae that are inevitable even in the best of medical care. It will improve patient faith and satisfaction irrespective of the outcome. We talk of a fetal life origin of adult diseases or early life origin of adult diseases. So when the fetus is exposed to undernutrition, it adapts and then when this same individual is exposed to overnutrition later in life, it leads to metabolic diseases. Similarly, faulty habits laid down in the foundation years about eating and lifestyle can lead to many adult diseases later. So we tend to, ex we tend to explain all this on genetics and ex express helplessness. But if we were to provide the right nutrition and other nurturing environment right from the beginning, right from intrauterine life and in the first two years of life, it would probably modify the expression of some of these faulty genes. This is known as epigenetics 
and this is the concept of care during the first 1000 days that is 270 days of pregnancy and the first two years of life. So adequate and appropriate care during this period regarding nutrition, immunization, growth and development monitoring, early pickup of deviations and trying to correct them early, screening for problems like birth and hearing defects very early because in this phase they are often inapparent but if not treated early enough they could have a lasting impact. All this can and should be done in the first thousand days to ensure good subsequent health. So friends while we are trying our best to treat diseases we need to keep thinking about various other related concepts and aspects of managing a patient which are not strictly technically following in the narrow definition of science. Today we in this video we have revised a few key messages regarding some of these concepts. Thank you. The next video in this series of Lest We Forget will be by Dr. Amdekar sir. Thank you.